Welcome to To The Point. After big election wins for Democrats last week, we sat down with Governor Gretchen Whitmer this week to talk about her plans for her second term with majorities in the House and Senate and what lies ahead. Governor, start with congratulations, uh, not just on your re-election, but we were just talking. This is the kind of election that I haven't seen in the 27 years that I've been covering politics in Michigan. Um, and it is not often that Democrats control all of the executive offices, the Senate and the House, not to mention the Supreme Court. What was that election night like for you as you saw those numbers come in and you saw those majorities start to rack up? Well, it was surreal. You know, I felt good going into the election, uh, but I'll tell you this, you know, Senator Jim Ananick, the Democratic leader in the Senate, kept telling me throughout, he's like, if you hit 52%, we're taking the Senate. And um, Donna Lazinski said, you know, if you got to hit that number, maybe even a little bit better. So to end up with an 11 point um, margin and to have flipped both the House and Senate, you know, it was really gratifying because it, we've been through a lot. It's been a hard few years and um, that the people of Michigan have, have spoken and have hired me to do this for four more years is it's the honor of my life and, and I was so grateful to see the outcome of the election last week. What are the things that you want to start with? I know that you're not going to lay out your entire agenda. They're getting ready for the inauguration. Even as we speak, there'll be a state of the state. There's all of that to do. But we know that there are some things that Democrats, when you were the minority leader, when you were in the House, there were things in the drawers of a lot of Democrats' bills that were just waiting to come out. I assume they do come out now. What are some of those things? Well, I think, you know, there, there won't be a lot of surprises, right? I mean, I've got a record of working in the legislature. People know where I stand on issues. I think um, one of the things that, you know, I'm, I'm impressing upon the legislature is we've got to stay tethered to the kitchen table issues. That's what we've worked on for four years. We've laid a great foundation. Now is the time to put our foot on the accelerator. So whether it's out competing other states for investment in Michigan or just continuing our work in education so we can get to that top 10 in literacy goal, um, those are going to continue to drive everything from the budget to policy uh, changes. I also acknowledge, though, the people of Michigan spoke, and they expect our fundamental freedoms to make our own decisions to remain. And so while we've amended the Constitution, and I'm grateful for that, it doesn't actually go into effect for about another month. And that's why uh, the, my lawsuit is still pending and, and sitting there, and it's also why I think we'll have to scour through old laws and clean them off the books. That'll be, that'll be something that I want to spend some energy on as well. Something you didn't mention is expanding Elliot Larson, doing away with right to work law, and maybe even coming up with some type of laws that deal with something that you described in your debate with us at Wood TV as something that makes you furious, and that's the gun violence that happens, not just in schools, but yep. we were talking specifically about that. So we know we are about to, um, acknowledge the one-year anniversary of the Oxford shooting. Without question, the heaviest days in which I've served as governor, because there's nothing you can say to a parent who's lost their child to gun violence. And so that's why I do think that with this new legislature, we will be able to get some common sense policies done that will keep our kids safer, won't impact hunters, you know, we're, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about secure storage. and red flag laws and background checks. And I think with this new legislature, we'll be able to get it done. I also would love to see us finally take some steps to make Michigan's capital as secure as other capitals are. We're one of only two states in the nation where people can bring their firearms in. I think that that doesn't make sense in today's uh, world. So that's another kind of aspect to that issue that I'd like to see us pursue. What is the advice, and I appreciate they're independent, and uh, leadership has already been elected, and they're already making their agenda. But as somebody who has served in the House and the Senate and always in the minority, what is your advice to the new leadership about, first of all, keeping together very narrow majorities? Mm -hmm. So let's stipulate that if Democrats lose one in the House, they're out. They've got a little extra room in the Senate because uh, of the lieutenant governor who can break a tie. But you gotta keep everybody you know, pulled together, and, and one former speaker told me that was kind of like herding minnows uh, <laughs> to get all of the caucus uh, kept together. What is the advice you would give for leadership to try to 
get things in front of their caucus that they can pass? Well, I think, you know, I've got great relationships with incoming Speaker Joe Tate and incoming Senate Majority Leader Winnie Brinks. They're both phenomenal leaders. I'm excited to serve with them. They're also very pragmatic, you know, as, as, as am I. And I think that will continue to be important that we're really thinking, what are the outcomes here? What are our goals? What does this mean for building up votes? And you know what? I still would love to be able to say everything we do is bipartisan. And so the minority leaders who are coming in will continue to have a seat at the table. I will keep holding those quadrant meetings. They don't stop just because Democrats are now the majority party in Lansing in both chambers of the legislature. A two seat margin is not overwhelming, as you pointed out, and that's why I think it's crucial that we are pragmatic, that uh, we are thoughtful, and we're inclusive. You wanted to fix the damn roads. And in order to do that in your first term, you decided you needed to bond some money because the legislature wasn't willing to talk to you about a tax increase at the gas tax, right? The legislature has since put some more money into uh, infrastructure funding and the federal government has come up with a big bipartisan bill that will help, but that's not enough. It's ongoing and it's gonna be there and the mechanism for funding roads, which is the gas tax largely, is going to become less and less reliable as we get more and more electrified. You were not able in your first term to get a new stream of funding. Is that something you think you can get? And a little inside ball, but I think it's interesting. Does it also change the formula? In other words, does PA 51 have to be looked at and, and decide a different way to split up money and where it comes from? I think what we're going to need to do is to get a group together to start putting um, a, a informed plan on the table and one that is can be uh, comprehensive and long term. The auto industry is going through a historic transformation and a lot of that work is happening here in Michigan and that's great for our economy. But we also have an outdated mode of funding our roads, as does every other state. No state has figured this out yet. Some have got some pilot projects that they've done to determine how you might measure miles traveled, for instance. Um, so I think we're up to this task. I think it's going to take, though, a lot of work. It's not going to come from one person. It's not going to come from one side of the aisle. This has to be a plan that is comprehensive, forward-looking, and inclusive of our, our locals and our state um, highway system. So there's work to be done in this space, but I, I do believe we're up to this challenge, and it's something that's important to me. I am told that the lame duck session in this legislature is going to be more lame than normal. In other words, I think very little, if anything, is going to happen. Is there anything that you would like to see the current legislature do, understanding that you could probably get that done just as well after January 1st? Yeah, I, you know, I, I will be interested to see if the Republican leadership wants to come back and do anything before they leave town. Uh, I do think that there are some things that we could check off the list. One of them is you know, Michigan has got a really important voice in national elections, but we go so late in the primary system that it, 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 our voice is muted because of it. Whether you're Republican or a Democrat, I think moving Michigan up in the primary system would be a good thing for the state of Michigan. It would be a good thing for the country because our voices are important. And so that is one of a handful of things I think um, might make sense for us to get done in the coming weeks. That is not just up to the legislature, right? That's right. The DNC and the RNC would have to sign off too. We have to change it via statute to permit it and then, you know, work on DC. Uh, that work in DC is being done on both sides of the aisle. Uh, the, the biggest question is, are we going to change the legislation? Well, I'm going to ask you the question you've been asked all week and you don't want to talk mm -hmm. about it. It's a conversation you say you're not driving, but the conversation is there. And you talk about moving up the presidential primary. Is that a primary in which you'll be participating? No. Just There's nothing out. else to say, no. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty unequivocal. And in an environment that could be changing. I've been unequivocal from the get-go, but um, for whatever reason people want to keep writing articles, I'm focused on Michigan. I ran for four more years as governor of the state of Michigan, and I'm going to serve them. We've got 30 seconds left. Number one priority, the thing you want to see done before this four years is over. Oh, there are so many things, but I really, my work around public education will continue to drive almost everything that I do. Governor, thank you for your time. Thank you.
When we come back, part of our conversation with the outgoing dean of the state congressional delegation. That's next, To The Point. Welcome back to To The Point. A few weeks ago, I sat down with Congressman Fred Upton, who opted not to run again in 2022, and that brought to an end more than four decades of service in Washington. We talked about changes he saw and some of the things he sees as successes in his career. Before we sat down for this interview, I had a little fun. I wanted to go back and refresh myself <laughs> on uh, your career. And it dawns on me, and you corrected me, it was 77, not 76 when you first? 77 was when I first went to Washington as a staffer. And yeah. so uh, uh, that's one thing we have in common. We're both former uh, staff members on Capitol Hill. Yours turned into be a much longer stay than mine. That was 40, what, five years ago? 40 Almost. in that yep, neighborhood? Yep, yep. And it was for a congressman named David Stockman. And so uh, there will be a couple of generations that won't appreciate the significance of that name. But David Stockman became famous for kind of being at least a for a time. The first tell-all book, I think, yeah, that's, from a former White House aide. That's right, was, and he was, uh, for, for a while, he was the face of Reaganomics um, after the 1980 election. Uh, there's a story, I hope you remember the story, that you were working in David Stockman's office on a, maybe a weekend morning. I don't remember when this happened. I, I know where you're coming from. We didn't talk about this before, but I, I was four years as a staffer, so I was, right. in essence, in charge of constituent service for him, uh, and it was a great job. And after four years, I was living with a guy from Niles. Uh, I was ready for a new challenge. Law school, whatever it was, I was ready for a new challenge. And uh, we had a, a one of those electric typewriters. You might remember that with this little finger, it would go back the space that you mistype right. something, <laughs> retype it with a chalk, and then you could put the right letter over right. it and you'd never know and we had one of those electric electric typewriters actually I, it's still in the office you, the equipment <laughs> stays so I still have it it'll be passed along but I was on that Sunday of Thanksgiving weekend in the afternoon I went in to use that to write, work on my resume after the four years and uh, I was working the phone rang about 2 30 in the afternoon on Sunday and I said Congressman Stockman's office how can I help you and this voice said is he there no, sir, he's not. Well, I'd really like to talk to him. Well, congratulations, Governor. Well, this is Ronnie Reagan. I know. <laughs> I recognize your voice. He said, well, let me give you my number. I'm at the ranch. Can you find him today? I said, yep, he lives next door to me on Capitol Hill. I'll find him. And uh, with that, he was offered a job in the, in the cabinet. And uh, so, uh, I ended uh, up uh, going to the, the White House and working for him as a junior legislative assistant. And then I ended up running the shop for legislative affairs. Uh, for, you know, for three, four years later. Yeah, and this was at the office of Mandy Putin. Budget. Correct. Yeah, and and that's where Stockman went. And he, uh, David Stockman, not to spend any more time uh, on him, other than uh, he was once famously taken to the woodshed. Oh, man, <laughs> more than famous. It was like I don't know how he survived, but he did. He I, had, I was he wondering that today as I was reliving that in my mind because. In my mind, it seemed like he was gone thereafter, but he wasn't. Yeah. He stayed for the for the duration. Yeah, it was like you could, uh, President Reagan. It was like he didn't have to open the window to shout his name, and and the folks that came after him. But he did survive, and you know he, his concern was the deficit and getting it down. And um, he talked to William Grider, who wrote the book, right. and um, it was really the first tell-all book. Now everybody does it, you know, right. Barr does it, all the, you know, Trump people are doing it, you know. And, and as a matter of course, neither Republicans or Democrats have been able to do much about the deficit. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it was what, a lot less back then. I'll yeah, say that's that. right. Yeah, it was, it might have uh, been like considered. Forty-eight anything. billion dollars, you know, anyway. You ran for office first time in 86, Six. 86, and so you've been in a different numbered district, but the same basic uh, geographic area for that entire time. What has it been like to see how the district has changed, how the needs have changed, maybe even how some of your views have changed over that period of time? Well, I, well, I think that I've been pretty consistent. Um, you know, I, I really got my stripes. First of all, I never thought I'd run for legislative office. Uh, my, my wife said, go ahead, you're not going to win. We'll get it out of your system. She never thought we were going to win. And she'll say that even today. Um, but I had the Reagan model, uh, a Republican president, a Democratic Congress. He got things done. 
The real test, of course, is your reelection four years later. Reagan, of course, won 49 states as a Republican. He won California, New York, Massachusetts. He only lost Minnesota, where, of course, Mondale, his, right. his opponent, came from. And so from the beginning, I said, I'm going to work with both sides to get things done. That's what I'm going to do. I, I, I'll confess, I never thought the Republicans would be in the majority because for my lifetime, pretty much, they never had been until I was elected a number of years later. And, of course, it's a real difference if you have that gavel and you can control the agenda and you end up being on a great committee like I did, Energy and Commerce, uh, and actually later become chairman with lots of successes and again worked with a Democratic president it was Obama all six years So the only way to get things done is to have him sign them into law Which you got to move through the house and the Senate to get things done uh, But you know when I was first elected, I think we had 18 members from Michigan Now we have 13. It's a big difference. So we've lost those electoral votes in the presidential elections our districts have grown, so now today there are 770-some thousand people. Um, and, you know, you got to rely on the redistricting foes who were certainly no friends of mine as they put much of my hometown, St. Joe, with Lake Erie. I spoke at Lakeshore High School a couple weeks ago now, and they said, why aren't you running again? I said, well, Lakeshore is, you know, that's St. Joe's rival. I said, there's supposed to be communities of interest are supposed to be together. and. You guys aren't with me anymore. <laughs> You're with Lake Erie. Yeah, it's Lakeshore because it's Lake Erie and Lake Michigan in the same district. But, you know, my first job was Tosi's Restaurant, a place I could walk to work. It's no longer in, in my district. Upton Middle School, no longer in my district. So really made the, the decision pretty easy when it came out in March last or earlier this year. When you talk about the, the size difference, it's not just the shrinking of the delegation, which is certainly important because of numbers you know, are, are the difference, particularly in the House. But at the time that you were the chairman of Energy and Commerce, Dave Camp was chairman of Ways and Means. Yes. Over in the Senate, I think... Well, we had Mike Rogers, oh, the, yeah, chairman, chairman of Intel. Intel. We had um, Candace Miller. She was a, a big wig in, in Homeland Security. We had Pete Hooks. We, we had... Our delegation was viewed as one of the top... Th not being a big state like California, Texas, Florida, right. New York, we were viewed as one of the top three or four influential delegations on both sides of the aisle, from a John Dingle and then later Debbie Dingle, but uh, Kildee, and I mean, we had important players on every committee in very senior positions able to deliver on things like the Great Lakes on autos. You know, that was the auto rescue plan uh, came for it because I was the lead with Dave Camp in the house. We had Debbie Stabenow, we had John Diggle, and together we saved that industry because otherwise it would have gone away. But all the suppliers, of course, remember, they paid the money back. I mean, those, that was important. But I was then a national campaign chair for John McCain. Uh, Carl Levin worked with Obama. Uh, and together we got both of them to say, you know what, this is really not partisan. We need to work together to save this injury, industry, save the state of Michigan. And we had the heft in our delegation to do so. The, the other two that I failed to mention over in the Senate, at the same time, um, Senator Levin was armed Carl services. Carl was viewed as armed services, and, chair of that, and, and, of course, the conscience of the Senate, too. He had right. that reputation. And Senator Stabenow was chairman of agriculture. So at that moment, as you point out, Michigan had a lot of controls, had a lot of influence, had a, a, a lot of gavels in their hands in both the House and the Senate. And in the leadership, too. Yep. And we're not, we're not there now. We, we don't have that same... Well, we've lost, universe. again, five members from mm -hmm. when I was first elected. And even though Newt, to his credit, Newt Gingrich, got rid of the seniority system. I mean, think about it. I mean, even today, 2022... I would not be chairman of Energy and Commerce if I had run this time in one. It would be still somebody else because I would be waiting my turn to have the gavel that I had a dozen years ago. So that changed uh, to the credit of the House. The Democrats haven't necessarily done that, but that was what the Republicans did. But losing five seats, losing that seniority that we had, uh, it's hurt our state in, in a lot of different ways, unfortunately. 
And in this particular cycle alone, if I have counted this correctly, there will be four sitting members today that will not return in January. So that means you lose whatever seniority goes yeah, along with that. Yeah, and maybe more. You know, I know well, this is airing after sure. the election. We're taping this before, right. but who knows what necessarily happens. Right. But you take the committees. I mean, um, ways and means. We don't, I mean, since Dave Camp was chairman, Republican for Midland, we don't have another Republican that's there now. We're not going to have one in this next Congress either. Uh, appropriations, we finally got somebody there, but we had three, four, five members there, uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, energy and commerce, we've got three. Well, I'm leaving, so uh, um, uh, Debbie Dingo and Tim Wahlberg likely to be elected uh, uh, for sure, but we're going from three to two, and that's, again, you know, it's, we, we lose that baseball bat, lose that clout. Let's talk a little bit about what it was like being the chairman of Energy and Commerce, because for people who don't watch or don't follow, that committee touches every thing. Every day, yeah. Energy, you know, commerce, covers the, the John gambit. Dingle, the former chairman, said it's really two words. It's like charades. First word, little, the. <laughs> <laughs> Second word, world. The right. world. We got it all. Yeah. Energy, environment, health care, some trade, telecommunications, uh, transition to digital, allowing us to have the devices to be able to text. All that came on my watch. Uh, on my is my uh, my service on the on the committee, and when you talk about getting things done, I I, I try to think back to, I, I always kind of get stuck uh, with the twenty first century cures because you worked on that for a long time, three we, years, and 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 you and I had many conversations about that, and to get it done with. Uh, Representative, get, I believe, from Colorado, the two of you, Democrats. Yeah, she came here to Grand yeah, Rapids. She did. I came to Denver. She actually was on this show. Um, we sat and did a joint show in Kalamazoo, yeah. I think. Um, and then get that signed, I think, on one of the last days he was in office by President, President Obama. President Obama. Uh, talk a little, little bit about the satisfaction that you got from that, because that was something that was bipartisan, and it wasn't it wasn't about politics it was very much about policy yeah so in a nutshell what this bill did it took us three years to get it done but it expedited the approval of drugs and devices so that by the FDA so that meant that all these companies Pfizer etc they were going overseas for the trials and the approvals because they could get them done in Ireland and other places China and not so much here so all that investment left and when you made the drug you had to do it overseas same with devices striker a big manufacturer of course in in uh, Kalamazoo so by allowing so we moved it through the committee it was tough sledding but at the end of the day 53 to nothing in our committee to get it done uh, we survived the filibuster in the in the Senate uh, Elizabeth Warren Bernie Sanders both wanted a filibuster they didn't want the change they got Chuck Schumer now the majority leader to support them in a filibuster to deny our bill from even being considered and we beat them this is where our program ended on television but our conversation continues with congressman upton here at woodtv.com about how the passage of the 21st century cures act paid benefits just a few years later done in 2016 then here's the here's the the real thing four years later we get covid by passing that bill it allowed Pfizer, Moderna, J&J &J, to not only get the emergency use authorization approval by the FDA for their drug, it also allowed them to manufacture it in advance. So when that approval came in December of 20, it allowed them to, or 19 I guess it was, it allowed them to literally distribute the drug day one. And I can remember the trucks rolling out, as it turned out, the Pfizer facility in, in Kalamazoo, not only all over the country, but ultimately the world. And with that legislation, getting it done, I don't know, eight, nine months before it otherwise would have happened, saved hundreds of thousands of Americans, let alone who knows how many millions uh, around the world. And of course, we're already in the, you know, a couple different boosters, but that legislation allowed that to happen and I led the, the bipartisan effort to get it done. I'm going back a little further, and 
I, I, my memory is not completely clear, but I'm going to go to the mid 2000s. Maybe George Bush, George W. Bush is still president. You wrote an act about energy independence. Right? Yeah, and we did that. And, and w tell me what that was about. It was and a little bit later. We did yeah. pass an energy bill of o in 05 okay. um, that I supported. That's how we got the daylight savings extension. And right. We've now lost it when this airs. So it's, it's <laughs> a, we lose that hour of daylight in the afternoon. People still had to change their clocks, but we just yeah. extended it a little bit. But, um, but yeah, I worked on a North American energy independent plan. So today, and we got these gas prices like they are there, you know, dollar or two higher than they were just a, a year or two ago. I think maybe it was about seventh or eighth grade economics or class that, that most of us learned about this thing called supply and demand. More supply you have and the demand, I mean, the ultimate determines the price. So here we have this gas price uh, going up big time. We've got to, you know, thanks to the Russians in, in large part. But we go to Russia, we, U.S., Biden, to say, you know, open, don't don't cut the supply, increase it so we can lower the price. It's impacting inflation, everything else, and we're not doing that here. So remember, the first thing that President Biden, I think, it was on his first day of office, uh, said we're canceling the XL pipeline. That pipeline comes from Canada to our refineries. It's going to expand production here. It's going to just send the 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 world the message that we're. we're we're on to natural gas, we're on to, you know, more production here, and all of a sudden it gets cut, and now we, we're desperate. The world is desperate for what we're doing. I mean, you look at Germany, they canceled because of Fukushima, they canceling all their nuclear in the next year or so, so you gotta make it up. So here we we understand climate change. I'm, you know, not a denier, it's, it's real, but as we try to reduce coal and everything else, all of a sudden Europe now to make up for what Russia's doing, and then you cut off the nuclear, guess what they're going back to? Coal. Um, you know, it's, we get North, you know, a North American energy independent plan is essential to the economy of this country. And we were on the right page until recently when things really went off the, the trail. After 36 years, what are some of the other things that you participated in, either legislatively or as a part of the Problem Solvers Caucus or one of the other caucuses that you're a part of? What people may not know is that many members are parts of many different caucuses that represent uh, their district, their viewpoints, the important things uh, that you want to participate in, participate in. What are some of the things that you think about? that you were involved in that you um, kind of look at and say, this, this was good. I was glad I was part of this. Well, I can probably take the rest of your show, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I never thought I'd be a legislator. I mean, it was never a dream that, that I had. Uh, and you get involved in things. And I'm, I'm probably on about 40 different caucuses. I haven't never added them up. But usually if someone says, hey, will you get on the diabetes caucus? I already am. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, it was important that we, in, at least in the House, capped insulin prices at $35 a month. I mean, there's millions of people. This was a drug that I think the royalty was $1. The inventor of this almost 80 years ago, you know, didn't take anything, but he said, you know, we're going to save lives. Um, why, why, why don't we have a cap on this, and, which is uh, what I supported. Uh, I'm in the Ukraine caucus, so I had been there a couple of times before what happened with Russia this last year. Uh, I know some of the people. I knew the leaders. I knew Poroshenko, who was there before Zelensky. You know, I've done with, met with Zelensky on Zoom in my house as we talk about the needed assistance there and how we have to win this thing. I've been here in Grand Rapids to one of the local Ukrainian churches uh, just to voice you know, Peter Meyer was there too, but just to voice our support for that. And it's not until you actually, you got to listen. I mean, and, and that's one of the things that I did as a staffer, certainly, for Dave Stockman way back when. But, you know, my votes, I've said, has always been hard to get. I want to work with both sides to get things done, particularly because if you make it partisan, you don't get things done. And that's why the Problem Solvers Caucus, frankly, was one of the reasons, that, well, a big reason why I ran two years ago because they were going to be willing to make a difference. So what are some of the issues? Well, we passed an immigration bill. Even President Trump said, Congress, do your job. Send me a bill on immigration. It's broken. And by the way, it needs border security. He's right. It needs to be part of the situation. So here we are now, years later, 
and we have the dreamers, kids that came age three, four, five. They're, you know, they've gone through our school system. They've married. They have families. They're working. They're paying taxes. And all of a sudden, you've got, because of the judicial situation, a threat that they're going to go back to wherever. I mean, we had, I helped a constituent who is a three-year-old, came from Poland, went through med school, and he had a couple of incidents with the law, speeding less than 10 miles an hour. Sorry, I'm guilty too. Parking next to a, a hydrant, I haven't done that. But he got picked up, thrown in jail, uh, and they were threatening to move him back to Poland. And I had the head of Bronson Healthcare call me and say, Fred, this is one of our best ER doctors. Can you help? And, you know, I worked with Governor Snyder. We got him a pardon. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he's practicing again. Thank God he didn't get sent back. Uh, I mean, just there are so many different cases like that. CHIPS, such an important bill. We've lost this. Again, problem solvers dealt with, we had the head of Intel come in and said, we've, we were at 40% production here in this country. We're now to about 15. The autos, appliances, uh, electronics, they got to have chips. Why are we ceding this to the rest of the world? And, you know, the Senate passed it with 70-some votes uh, for it uh, more than a year ago. Finally, we took it up just a couple of weeks ago. And, of course, there were some that said, oh, you can't give Biden a win. He's up for re-election maybe in 24. You can't give him a win. We'll, we'll do a better bill, in, you know, with a new Congress in 24. No, we can't wait for some of this stuff to get done. Problem solvers were the ones that get it done. So, you know, issues like that, I mean, you got to stand up to your leadership from, from time to time. Uh, I still have a pretty good record in terms of voting with a, a majority of my Republican colleagues, but, you know, we all work together, you know, our delegation, again, on the Great Lakes that President Trump wanted to eliminate the money uh, for the environment for Great Lakes water. I mean, you can't do that. And, you know, we stood together and... We actually got an increase. So well, the Problem Solvers Caucus be one of the things that you look back with considerable pride knowing that you helped kind of move that along because that, that's a new idea. And for people who don't know, who haven't watched the show, it's a group, equal number of Republicans and Democrats who join together and agree to agree, essentially. And the numbers have gotten big enough that if they take a position on a particular bill, they can help move the needle no matter yeah. who's and who, we did. who is in control. We did that on chips. We did that on the infrastructure bill. We did that in passage of, the, of an immigration bill in the House. And the Senate didn't do the immigration piece. We've run out of time, and I regret that. But for 27 years that I've been hanging around, you've always answered the bell for these interviews. I appreciate that. I appreciate your service. And this will not be the last time we talk. Thanks for coming. I hope not. <laughs> Congressman Upton is one of four current members of Congress who will not be returning to Washington in January as our new delegation gets down to business with one fewer member than we have had for the last 10 years due to population shifts. In the next few weeks, we'll be talking with new incoming leaders and some of the folks in leadership who are leaving due to term limits in Lansing. We'll have one such show next week without going Senate Minority Leader Jim Ananit. Join us then, to the point.